Come on. <clears throat> and we are live. Yep, this is going to be a good one. Oh, my gosh. The great customer success debate is about to happen. <laughs> We're going to find out just how much these folks agree. I've got uh, Josh Greenbaum, Phil Wainwright, and Bonnie Tender wave to the camera, everybody. Uh, this is the most guests I've had, so this is going to be a, a, a classic. Um, I'm going to uh, briefly just explain the rules, um, but customer success, I think, is a very, very potent topic, and ultimately the question becomes, it matters a hell of a lot to vendors and vendor marketing teams, but does it really matter to customers? And I'm hoping by the end of this show, we'll have a little bit of clarity here, uh, though if Josh gets kicked out of his Airbnb too soon, that might be a problem, so Josh, just try to hold off your... <laughs> Airbnb stay for a few minutes and we'll get this done. I think we'll be good. Um, excellent. Um, there's a few special rules to this show, uh, which I'm going to explain. It's a special format today. Uh, but the first rule goes for all of my shows, which is uh, the audience is smarter than the panel. So you guys are welcome <laughs> to interrupt us at any point with your snark and your questions. So please do that. Don't hesitate. Uh, and and finally, I just want to say this is Phil Wainwright's debut on my video show. Welcome, Phil, from the UK. Uh, pleased to be here. And, um, yeah. yeah, I was just trying to work out how to add a comment because because uh, Brent says, didn't I just see Phil at Dreamforce? And, yeah, you did, Brent. Uh, I, I flew back to the UK. Uh, well, I arrived this morning, uh, left San, San Francisco on, uh, on Wednesday night. And, Phil, if you need to go grab like a – some mainline caffeine to inject that would be into your directly into your veins that'd be great jeff scott is already snarking on josh which place jeff which uh, kick, kick, oh, kicked out of my airbnb out. kicked out of dream forest or kicked off this show i want to know which one <clears throat> special shout out to brent leary who is uh my video uh, mentor and a, and a great support to me during the last few months thanks brent always great to see you in the chat um, and, and Phil, I just wanted to say uh, it's great to have my colleague Phil Wainwright on the show. He's probably influenced my thinking as much as anyone. If you haven't been tracking his frictionless enterprise concepts on Diginomica, you definitely should. Uh, and with that, uh, I want to just briefly tell you the rules of this little debate. I wanted to have Phil and Josh here because they wrote posts on customer success that struck me as taking very different angles. And uh, whether they actually disagree is one of the big suspense points here. But I just want to read to you very briefly just to show you a contrast. Phil wrote a piece about value engineering and in in its role in customer success on Diginomica. One of the things he said is helping customers realize the value they're looking for becomes the core goal of the customer success function rather than simply maximizing adoption and usage. So that's all about Phil tracking how we've started to move beyond the, the SaaS metrics of things like churn into more customer-focused, outcome-focused metrics, which sounds good to me, much more granular stuff. Then I turn over to, to Josh's post, and we're going to share the links to these posts, and I read, I think customer success has been a cover-up, plain and simple, since its inception. It's been a cover-up because the continuing problems across the industry with project implementation success, change management, user acceptance, data migration, and delivery of measurable long-term value tells the story of business as usual. Ouch. So I think this is a really juicy and important topic. And because I really want some help understanding these arguments, Bonnie Tinder of Raven Intel has agreed to sort of referee this discussion. Thank you, Bonnie, for that. And she'll probably have some data points as well from Raven's perspective on this. So welcome, Bonnie. For sure. Thank you. So with that, what we're going to do is we are going to give Phil and Josh the opportunity to share what inspired their posts, and then we'll have them go through a few of the key points that they believe in. And and eventually we'll get everyone interacting as well. And Bonnie will have some commentary and I can't wait to see where this goes. So please pop in your questions at any time, your views on customer success. We're not going to be able to do the full origins of the customer success uh, metric movement today, but there's plenty of blog posts out there on that topic as well. So Josh, since you have to leave early, I'm going to start with you. Uh, tell me a little bit about, um, what inspired your rant? Okay. Can you well, which by slide? which by the way which by the way is a little bit about Zoho as well because you had just right. come off of a Zoho analyst event. So part of your post is about Zoho itself. Can you pop that slide up? 
Oh yeah. Okay. Let's see if let's see how we do on the slide. Is, yeah. That depressing. That's, that's sort of a, that's sort of the, the ur text of my you know of my rant. Um, yeah. 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 Let's see how we do. Uh, and, and if holding share the, screen mm -hmm. uh, window. Uh, I think I have it. Let's see how we do here. Can we see cool. it? Cool. Oh, yes. wow. All Joel. right. Okay. So I, I, I don't want to spend too much time in this, but this is this is a data set I've been tracking for a number of years. And this really is formulates a ton of my thinking, which has, has been focused on customer success or lack thereof for a while. And I think this what this is the story this is telling is that the the gray and the the orange lines are the growth of I, IT spending. That's tracked by a couple of the major firms, uh, analyst firms, and this is just publicly available information. Um, so the growth of IT spending is these jagged lines hovering, you know, from somewhere no, almost 10%. That was uh, our growth of Y2K at the beginning of the century uh, through the current uh, moment. And then the blue line is the growth in productivity. And this is meant to show that there is, on the aggregate, no correlation. We spend a ton of money on IT and we don't get a whole lot to show for it. And that, of course, we know is 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 a macro view or the micro view. There's a lot of companies that are successful, but but what does that mean? Um, is is sort of and how do you achieve that is kind of the big the big question I've been thinking about for a number of years. This particular rant started with yet an you know I guess two things. One, showing up at a, at an industry conference with a company that that is sort of a virgin in this territory and from the enterprise side. Uh, they've been delivering customer success for a long time, but they want to be in the enterprise software space, in the big enterprise software space. And um, I was sort of imagining, what, what if someone actually really did customer success the way I would like it to be personally? And what would that look like? And, and because fundamentally, you know, there is really this, this huge disconnect, uh, particularly, and again, I'm going to talk about, you know, I'm talking about large enterprise software projects and, and sort of large enterprise SaaS, and I think that's going to be a point of, a fine point in our conversation. There's sort of consumer-grade SaaS and, and enterprise SaaS, and I think particularly in the enterprise software space, we're just not doing a good job. And all of those customer success executives who've been appointed and, and you know, and, and given a badge and told to do the customer success thing, I, I don't see a whole lot to show for it. I just don't see the metrics that are changing anywhere. And I think, you know, Bonnie and I work together. I think Bonnie's data you know, kind of shows business as usual. So that, I just got tired of it. <laughs> and thought I would just, I would just throw that, you know, throw a wrench out there and said, hey, you know, customer success, what are we doing? Because we ain't achieving the goals. Got it. Uh, no, I'm going to paste the links to both the blog posts in the chat. And if you can't uh, see the links, I'm going to also uh, later read the titles. Or if you're listening on audio replay, you'll have the titles in a little bit. Uh, but Phil, I get the impression. Do you, do you take, Phil, take I'll down the slide, by the way. Okay, I'll take oh, the slide. Leave it up? Oh, okay. okay, I'll leave it down. I was going to ask Phil if he wanted to comment on it, but oh, okay. Phil, well, Phil, I, I, get... I do actually. Yeah, yeah. But, okay, great. But, but I, I don't need the the, the chart there. Okay, cool. I, I mean, you may want to bring it back up, but um, uh, but yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I. I mean, thanks, first of all, for the call out for Frictionless Enterprise, which I've been kind of uh, expanding on in a series of articles over this year. And it's a concept I've been brewing in my mind for like over 10 years now. And one of the premises of Frictionless Enterprise is that digit, uh, connected digital technology changes everything. Uh, and there's a whole load of assumptions that come from the industrial era. And I think one of them is productivity stats and and. I mean, that chart you showed, Josh, is the Bureau of Labor Statistics uh, perception of productivity. And, and I don't think uh, that, you know, measuring productivity by industrial era uh, uh, statistics uh, in the digital era necessarily gives you a great view. Um, because I, I think one of the things that that statistic omits very substantially is the amount of value being delivered as part of uh, a product. Uh, for example, um, uh, you know, if you spend more time on sustainability and being a more sustainable vendor and having more sustainable products, that may actually mean you look less productive according to those statistics, but you're still delivering more value that the customer's interested in. So, yeah. so, so, um, but, but on the other hand, I think that, uh, 
also the industrial era has left us with companies who perceive that all they have to do to satisfy the customer is sell them a product and preferably get out of there as fast as possible straight afterwards before they discover that the product doesn't actually deliver the solution that they need. And that's what customer success is all about. And again, the technology gives us the ability to measure customer success in completely different ways now. So, so I think, um, but it's still early days. And so the fact that customer success has not made an impact on the statistics that we want to look at is, you know, very is, is that it's still kind of a small percentage of what technology vendors and the whole of the rest of the industry is doing at the moment. So I don't think we should we should necessarily dismiss it at this stage of the game. So no. one quick clarification, Phil. Uh, I get the impression that one of the things you try to do in your posts, and I, I pasted the most recent Diginomica post you did on this uh, in the chat, which was uh, came back when you came back from the gain site conference and i thought it was interesting by the way that jeffrey moore in the keynote also commented yeah. on the kpis and value engineering and and the role that they play in customer success in case someone wants to search for that on diginomica but i get the impression one of the things you're trying to do in your post is to is to move the customer success conversation away from the traditional SaaS metrics that started this thing around things like churn and retention and talk about it in terms of more customer focused outcome type metrics and also ones that are really more about the customer centric measurement of that rather than the vendor. Is, is that part of what you're trying to do in, in your posts? Well, yeah, yeah, it it is very much, and I think one of the, I mean, again, the frictionless enterprise thing. Part of that is something which I call the XS effect, um, where X stands for everything as a service, and I think it all, it did start with SaaS uh, in being connected to their customers. SaaS vendors were able to see how their customers were using the product, and that was what gave birth to customer success. They were able to do things like track adoption, track usage, um, and they realized that customers who were not using their product very much tended not to renew, and so that was a bad thing, and so they invented customer success. Um, but Customer success, the problem with customer success, and, and you know, when I started looking into, the, into this a couple of years ago, the reason was I was having conversations with people, and I realized that they were using the word customer success, the phrase, meaning something completely different from what I meant by it. Because, you know, to me, customer success is customers being successful. But to a SaaS vendor, customer success is, wow, we, we got more revenue out of this customer. So, you know, that, that, that's not actually what customers are interested in. You know, customers do not exist to buy more of your product. Customers exist because they have goals that they want to achieve through purchasing your product. And that's what success should be. Customer success should be measuring the outcomes. I think that some vendors in the SaaS industry and in the wider XS industry, as this goes to everything as a service, are starting to understand that, but it's a, still a very small minority. Um, and, and I think that's what we need to get through to get to real benefits out of su customer success. Well, and even the term success is a little misleading because it actually implies that there's success there as opposed to, you know, in a lot of cases, it's unsuccessful. So this idea of it's really about customer goals and customer value creation as opposed to, you know, did I sell more here? So, yeah, yeah, it's I think it's important to define because it means a million different things to a million different, you know, organizations. And, and I think one of the problems we can, we can really drive drive down to the origins of this, you know, what is the, what is the successful SaaS vendor? Who, how is that success measured? Is I think one of the, you know, one of the, one of the basic problems, and I and I sort of rant about that in my in my post, is that if you know if 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 Wall Street all Wall Street cares about is you know is more sales, and frankly in many cases the hell with profits, just do more revenue, then then you know, and, and the and the companies are performing according to that metric. Who is the real customer? And I argue somewhat again, acerbically and maybe not entirely correctly that in a way in a certain way they're treating. Wall Street and the investor community as the, the most important customer. If all they're doing is executing on this revenue strategy without, without you know, worrying about what is actually being delivered to the customer. And yeah, I, I, yeah, I would say, Josh, to, just to, to, to underpin that, I mean, on every investor call that you listen in on, the metrics that they use are EBITDA, revenue, customer count. Those are the things that everybody cares about when 
the leading indicators to all of those things are, you know, net promoter score, referenceable customers, software adoption, all of these factors that you measure in the customer success function. Those are all of the things that, you know, build either a, a positive or negative EBITDA revenue, all of those type of things. So. Yeah. And, and Bonnie, I think that's why it's so interesting that Josh used Zoho as a vendor to talk about because Zoho is a private company. It has no intention ever of listing as a public company. And therefore, it is not constrained to these quarterly reporting windows that distort um, the measurements, because at the moment, you know, if your window is only every three months, then you're not going to build long term relationships. You're, you're, you're not incentivized to build long time relationships with your customers in which you may actually it may be better for the customer to buy less of your product this year in order for them to end up buying more of your product in two years time. But no vendor is incentivized by Wall Street to take that kind of that kind of uh, that kind of view. And that's, you know, and that was part of the fantasy of, of you know, of Zoho doing that. I think, you know, and this is, I think, you know, I, I was once asked what is the difference between the kind of analyst I am and the kind of, you know, and a financial analyst. And it's, as Phil was alluding, it's the three-month window that I don't have. And I don't think any of us have. We're not looking at three months. What can you do for, you know, customer in three months? It's what do you, you know, what's the long term? What is, what's, what's, what does it look like two years from now, five years from now? That's what the customer is trying to achieve. And, you know, and I think that that's where we, we get into a, a bit of a mess. I, do, I, I need to respond to Phil's uh, comment about my chart because I totally agree. You know, these are, uh, these are old school. Here we go. Yeah, well, you know, um, you know but I'm agreeing. The, I, I'm looking at old school BLS statistics. That's that's capital productivity and labor productivity. Those are those are definitely, you know, the metrics we have to work with. And that's why I chose them. And to be honest, because they, they, they work. Look at that. It's a pretty dramatic spread. Um, and I think that you're absolutely right, Phil. We, and I think this is where we're going. We need better metrics. We need much better metrics and better ways to measure success and a better conversation about success because the one we're having, <coughs> excuse me, as an industry isn't working. Um, I, I also throw one more thought out there, which is, you know, again, I'm talking about primarily, you know, what, how, vendors who sell complex enterprise software are successful for their on, on behalf of their customers. God, I love the way the light keeps shifting in this room. I'm getting, um, I'm gonna go <laughs> yeah, you look good, actually. Oh, yeah, okay. right. I, 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 yeah, th those are the prison bars. Um, that are, um, but I, I think, you know, so to, you know, in the world of enterprise software that I'm focused on, customer success starts with a successful implementation. It only starts. Then you, then you go on to what is the total value that's delivered, but it's important to, it's different than consumer grade software. So a lot of SaaS software doesn't need a complex implementation. So, and I'm, you know, we talked about Gainsight, you can look at what Gainsight, a company like Gainsight does, they can jump right in to a much more mature concept of customer success because a lot of the customers aren't, aren't trying to do a big complex implementation. They're just, they've got good software, or software that's SaaS ready for implementation so they can get get the job get to the job of customer success much more fast. Yeah, and I want to take that up with you later, Josh, because that I, I find that kind of a limiting definition of success on some level, but I know what you're talking about, but that's for a little bit later in the show. Uh, I, I did want to bring up two points. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on my views on this, but I did harass vendors on Diginomica about this in a post. Uh, if you do a search on attention uh, vendors, please stop the customer success hype train. Uh, basically, I came up with proof points that are impossible for vendors to achieve to, to make them be quiet about customer success for a while. But uh, the thing that I wanted to bring up about customer success is the reason why I like this topic is I think vendors are pushing it, but it's a bit of a Trojan horse to allow people like us to talk about what really matters. And I don't know if you all have experienced this. I'm pretty sure all of you have where we've been in vendor sessions where we're able to successfully turn the tables on the vendor when they start bringing this topic up. And I, what I find is that customers of vendors, when they want to talk about customer success, they actually want to talk about everything pertaining to the vendor relationship. So it's not just about measuring new stuff. It's about how how it is to interact with your support people, how it is to interact with you know, your salespeople, uh, the licensing agreements, all that stuff now gets, in my view, put on the table. And that's why I think it's a very potent topic because vendors quickly lose control of the narrative because once you bring it up, people want to redefine it and say, well, how can you
can you talk about success without talking about how shitty your support is? You know, uh, so this is one of the things I really like about this topic. Um, and, and the other thing I really like is this notion of now that the tools are available to measure stuff all the time. And I think this hits close to home for you, Josh, given a lot of your work on project delivery. Then what is the excuse for for screwing up projects where you, you it takes you months to understand that a project is going south when you can be gathering data that allows you to make course corrections? And to me, those are the besides new metrics, those are the two potent uh, areas I'd like to get into. And with that, Bonnie, I'd like to ask you just a little bit, if you can share with the audience a little bit about your methodology and how you would work with vendors on this to kind of help them with this issue of, of taking the pulse of customers. H how do you do that? Yeah. So we look at customer success in um, a uh, implementation. Um, implementation is a moment that matters significantly in the life a cycle of a, a customer, uh, I would argue to say it's the most important moment because that sets the tone for the relationship, um, good or bad, for the life um, of, of that customer. So we look very closely at the success of an implementation. And, um, you know, if there's a partner involved, most of the, the uh, implementations that we look at do have a partner-led implementation we look at standard measurements, things like, you know, was the project done on time, on budget? What was the satisfaction with the partner, with the project, with the vendor? Um, you know, we look at some of those standard, um, you know, measurements, but then we ask deeper questions. Did you get the value that you thought going in? Um, you know, and to what extent was that value delivered? Was it partial value? Um, was it full value? Did you go backwards in some cases? We have that's a really important one. We ask questions about the team involved. Did the team stay intact? Did they change um, throughout the course of the project? Those are huge leading indicators that um, there's something that went wrong. Um, and you know, typically, when there's churn on the team or there's change orders during the course of a project, all of a sudden we see satisfaction in decline as well. So those are like the standard sort of metrics that we look at. Um, and then certainly we want to understand, okay, in terms of lessons learned, the specific goals that you had, um, you know, with the scope of this project, you know, what, what, what was the outcomes of those? And that's different on every client. And I, I go through this long list of, of things that we look at um, to show that, you know, we can ask those standard questions and then benchmark a variety of types of implementations and have sort of a standard set of metrics about the hygiene of a project and say, you know, was this successful or not? Um, but, you know, we can look at a project, whether it was a small module or full-blown install, and we have some relative sort of um, KPIs to understand. With that said, then we also have, you know, the more valuable metrics, where, which is the lessons learned and things like that that we look at. All of this to say, you know, what we look at is completely from the customer side of things. And I think that that's a really important factor. It's one thing to judge customer success using the lens of the vendor themselves or the vendor relationship manager. It's yet another to get the information directly from the client. And that's what's most important to us is that authenticity that you get when it's di feedback direct from the client. Um, and so, a, a, you know, a, a vendor is able to look back at that point in time, that implementation, and really have a good set of metrics to say, okay, where does this relationship go from here? And um, I think there's a, a lot of power in having that information independently tracked as well. I don't want to put off Joel's question any longer. Uh, this is really a, I guess, a little bit for Josh, but is this a C, CX, uh, CS or a product issue or have we oversold in the sales process? Well, wow, that's, there's a lot to work yes. with there. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, you know, I think, I think, um, Yes, it, it, we are overselling, and you know, it, to, you know. Look, uh, at the end of the day, my view, and I think that you know, again, we're 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 looking at this 
from ourselves from a bunch of different perspectives. But I think at the end of the day, you know, you have you have these, these basic fundamental problems. One of them is Wall Street. The other is sales culture. And sales culture, particularly in field sales culture, which is fueled by the Wall Street mentality of what did you do for me this quarter and that's all that matters, is going to do, you know, make, make a lot of false promises. It's going to bring on the wrong partner or just the partner, the name brand partner at big GSI because they know that will help make the sale because those folks who are also not held accountable, in my opinion, you can start pointing fingers at them anytime you want. I'm ready to go, uh, locked and loaded there. But they, you know, they, 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 they muck it up. So yeah, it's a, it's a sales problem. It's a customer support problem. It's a perception problem. Um, and, and I want to, um, oh, there's, hello, Timo. Good to see you. Um, what up, Timo? We, we, we've got the, you've got the Europe thing going on. If, if we you know, can say you're from Europe now. Um, the, the, the other problem fundamentally I want to point fingers where they need to be pointed is with the customers themselves. And I hate to say it, but they're part of the problem. And right. I, 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 I'll drop that there because I think uh, you probably want to run with that at some point too. I, yeah, I can you... pick up on that, John. Actually, um, oh, please if, do. If now is a good time, because um, yeah. uh, uh, but but I think the other thing that is at fault is the entire way that enterprises mm -hmm. are siloed, uh, and people don't talk to each other, and and, uh, and 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 this needs to be much more joined up. And you're not going to get success, customer success truly happening unless you get that joined up thing. And one example of that, because when Bonnie was talking, I was thinking that one of the most important things in customer success is, is to make sure you're talking to the right people when you're measuring it. Um, and uh, Jeffrey Moore made a very uh, perceptive comment in, in his presentation uh, on customer success at the Gainsight Conference. So, so he was basically saying, well, if you're really going to make customer success be about business value realized, then you have to link customer success back to the salespeople who rationally spoke to the executives who commissioned the project to achieve a particular business goal. Because what often happens typically is that the salespeople hand off the, the, the sale to an implementation team. And then there's a customer success team. And the customer success team will, this is Jeffrey Moore's point, will go into the customer and say, well, what are your goals from this, uh, f f from using our product? And the people they're speaking to actually don't know anything about the conversation the salespeople had with the with the CXO team. And they basically say, well, no, I've got no idea. I've just, just been told to implement this and, and get it working. Um, and so, Bonnie can survey those IT people and say, you know, was it successful? And the IT people will say, well, the implementation didn't particularly work very well. But we managed to fix it in the end because the support team were not as shit as they as we thought they might be. Um, and the business can still not be successful because the whole implementation doesn't actually achieve the business value that people originally thought they were buying. Uh, and so you've got to join up that whole process. And this is what some of the vendors that – um, that, that, that are most mature in their use of customer success are starting to realize now. They've actually got to go all the way from the, the, the business value case that's made in the beginning and link through what they've delivered and how the customer is using it because, as Josh says, the customer is responsible for failure as, as much as success uh, very often. Um, are the, is the customer actually getting the value that they originally anticipated? Right. Um, Timo says it's all about incentives. Show me the sales comp plan and I can tell you what will go wrong. I think that comes back to this question of how you measure this properly using the wrong metrics. Uh, and then Joel's saying, I wonder how many times customer service hears sales said, pointing to <laughs> Phil's disconnect uh, silo land there and how you, Josh, I know silos always perks you up. So, um, <laughs> Josh, I, I felt like in your post, you were a little bit torn between trashing customer success as a useless exercise, and, and but then maybe saying, no, we actually have to radically redefine it instead. Um, have you have you resolved that internal identity conflict or? <laughs> no, the answer is, no, we need to, you know, we need to embrace it. And, and maybe the first thing we need to do is take it out in the backyard and shoot it. Um, <laughs> Uh, but <laughs> excellent. Um, it's, it's pretty graphic. Okay. Thank you. Um, well, you should see that I've been, I'm in Oregon, you know, things are okay. things different here. Um, no, but I, I think, I think it's really, it's, I want customer success to succeed. And I really mean that. 
On the other hand, and I use this term, uh, I, which I created reluctantly, customer successing, see, you know, like greenwashing and whitewashing, often it's just, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot of hooey. It's bullshit. Let's just call it what it is. And that, that doesn't do anybody any good, it, it, except if you're a Wall Street investor and you feel good. They, the company, you know, just like you're greenwashing, you feel good, pet yourself on the back, you, you, got, you check that box. Um, but I think, you know, and I, I think that we really need to, to focus on it by, and, and, you know, and, and part of the way to do that is to, unfortunately, you're going to have to break a lot of, a lot of, a lot of cultural norms in the process. Wall Street's death grip on, on sales and sales, you know, kowtowing to Wall Street are two of the biggest problems we have to, we have to fix first. And I don't know if we can, you know, that's the other problem. That's why, again, I sort of picked on Soho because they, they don't have that. Problem. Maybe they can be the ones to do this uh, to, to really do because otherwise, you know, everyone is sort of beholden to this investor led thought process. Um, it's hard to break. Right. Although I would like to think that publicly traded companies can push back a little harder and provide more aggressive guidance on what they're actually trying to do for their customers in the long term rather than just simply be beholden because obviously not every company is going to be Zoho, right? Zoho can chart a unique. Uh, path here, but a lot of companies right. can't. So let's see what Maureen has to say. We may not need to radically redefine it, but we need to start pulling effectiveness data in from the other functional areas. Can't just look at success in a silo. Bonnie, Amen. we're about, uh, we're a little more than halfway through this conversation, depending on when Josh gets kicked out of his Airbnb. <laughs> Um, what, what is your, um, what is, what, have we missed anything so far? What is your take on how far we've gotten here? Yeah. What I would say, I love Maureen's comment that she just made, and it's not even just pulling the data in from other functional areas. Um, you know, customer success is, is definitely not a silo. And I think even within customer success, you have multiple, you know, ways to track that success that's in silo. So, being able to synthesize um, the customer experience, you know, a single place, I think that's really important from, and, and also to understand, you know, and John, to your point earlier, my executive buyer, Phil, I think you mentioned this, my executive buyer um, may have one set of, you know, values that they want delivered versus the IT group, which is running the project have yet another you know, which of those, you know, stakeholders do we serve here? Um, and, you know, or, or is it both? And I think just um, synthesizing all of those goals, putting them into a single place to and, and measuring those against, you know, reality is, is important. But, I, you know, this idea of, of breaking down all the silos of data, I think, is is a real key. Yeah, and I and I think um, that was something that really uh, kind of concerned me. I was talking to to a lot of vendors, really saying, "Well, how do you measure success, and how do you how do you keep it on track?" And and what I discovered is that if you talk to the more, the, the very advanced progressive vendors in customer success, um, they're really establishing very concrete KPIs which can be measured. So Solonis I spoke to, who actually they don't have a customer success um, uh, department. They have a customer value department. They, they, they talk in terms of value. So, so what they will do is, as part of the sales process, they will get the customer to identify uh, some specific metrics, um, very often typically financial metrics, which they can go back to in a year's time and by which they can judge the success or not of the uh, of the implementation uh, so that's kind of uh, a really uh, uh, a, a, a really strong tie to be able to and it's something that can go to timo's point can go into incentives as well you know the salesperson can get incentivized based on to what extent those kpis were met a year down the road compared to uh, to com com compared to the promise that the salesperson sold, um, uh, Cooper do this as well in 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 the procurement space where they do things like you know what are your goals in terms of reducing the time it takes to process a purchase requisition or the amount of uh, spend that you have under management through through our system. What is the percentage of total spend going through 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 our system? So. Um, 
the, the problem, I think, is that's great when you have something that can be measured very easily in financial terms. It's more difficult with something like productivity, which, as we discussed earlier, is impossible to measure. Can I, 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 I'd like to, Maureen's made a couple of really interesting comments about silos, and I want to jump in on that because I think, you yeah. know, the, 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 part of the problem with the world today is that we've really, um, we, we've really, we, we've created an, an enterprise software market, which is of buying about silos. The vendors sell product in siloed fashions. They, they sell an ERP to the SAP ERP folks over here and to the Oracle ERP folks over here. The CRM folks are somewhere else. The procurement is over here in a completely different department. They don't talk together. And yet, more and more, modern SaaS software requires that the technology underpinning become integrated, that these silos don't remain siloed, at least from a technical and, and process standpoint. So, so right away, we're already in a, in, a, in a place where success from a software implementation standpoint depends on a function called silo busting that itself is often unsuccessful. So, so it, it turns into sort of a, a you know, worst case scenario all around. You've got silos, you need to break them, you can't break them, so therefore you can't be entirely successful. And in fact, what then happens is success looks differently. If, you're, if you can build that integrated end-to-end -end process, success is gonna be completely different for each stakeholder, depending on what piece of the pie, what part of the elephant that they're involved in. So it becomes a, an extremely hard thing to scale, but I think at the end of the day, you know, we need to, ask the customer, the stakeholder, what, what is their definition and stop relying on these, these external vendor, you know, this is how I measure it, because I think that's, that's, where, the, that's where the problem begins, primarily. Mm. Mm. John, I can see you're waiting to say something. I got something I know, go ahead and respond on. and we'll get to Timo's comment. Go ahead yeah. and respond and uh, then we'll be, get to be, Timo's. Be, because, because I think, you know, we have to talk about the customer's responsibility here. It, you know, there, there is there is not a lot of point in being successful in implementing inappropriate technology or in automating broken processes. You can successfully do that and still have a company that is uh, that, that is a wreck. Um, and and uh, and I think that too many technology vendors will just say to the customer, um, "Well, yes, okay, we will implement this for you. We'll implement it really well," and 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 then. You know, move on to the to the next customer. Um, whereas, I I think a smart technology vendor will actually say, and this, you no, know, I've heard customer success people at Salesforce, for example, uh, talking about this. Sometimes you could be brutally honest with the customer and say, well, you know, maybe have you thought about doing it this way? Because if you do it that way, you may not achieve the same level of success that if you actually approach it in a different way. Um, and so I think part of customer success, which is going to be very difficult for some vendors to get to and, and some customers to accept, is actually saying, well, Mr. Customer, based on what we see other companies in your industry doing, really, this is a better way to do than what you've got planned out. Right. And just to interject here on that, uh, uh, when I wrote my attention vendors, customer success challenge piece, Josh issued a really good kind of a yeah. rebuttal, but in a really good way that reframed it around the customer perspective. He called it attention customers. You're responsible for vendors, customer success efforts too. I'm going to paste a link to that in the chat, but I thought that was a really essential post as far as sort of delineating what some of the customer responsibilities are because josh i don't think we can cover like all of that post here because it was a pretty elaborate undertaking on your part but what was there was there a core thing you wanted to get across there because i think that was pretty important well i, I guess I, the core thing i want to get across is uh, the thing that shocked me the most about my startup pro q which is trying to measure you know the implementation process is how widespread the Stockholm sy syndrome was with with customer executives, and they you know they really got used to failure and and baked it into the model. And to the extent that you know I just one of the it was the biggest mistake I ever made as an analyst to think that if I could fix this problem with you know with implementation success with a simple survey tool, then everyone would flock to it because of course they don't want to keep screwing it up. But actually. Turns out a lot of people 
how, you know, that's the way to cook the combo. Do you want, tell me what the other problem is. Because that one I'm not interested in solving. So I, I, I think that was, that's how a lot of the foundation of that ramp was, hey, y'all, you know, you got, you got to, you got to get in the game too, or, or stop, you know, stop bemoaning the fact that it's not working. Josh, your audio is warbling a tad on my end, but uh, but I know you have to go fairly soon anyway. Uh, Timo good. says, Timo says, sorry if you already covered it, but the biggest and most important shift for me as someone who cares deeply about customer success has been the move to cloud subscription pricing. No success equals no renewal, and it's been a great antidote to drive by sales dumps. Comment. I got I got to take that. I've got to take that. Sorry, Timo. <clears throat> With all due respect, the data does not show any shift in implementation success in the aggregate since the dawn of SaaS. We took the data from the, the on-premise days, and you compare it to the data from SaaS days, we're still having the same failure rates. Yeah, but I think that is because the, and, and this is another point I like that Jeffrey Moore made. Uh, no, it wasn't Jeffrey Moore who made this point. It was it was Nick uh, Nick Meta, who's the CEO of Gain, Gainsight. He was basically saying, well, in the beginning, the SaaS industry, all the executives had come from the on-premise software industry. They, they'd been selling licensed software. They'd been doing on-premise software projects, and they took a similar mentality in of, you know, focusing on closing deals um, and it was, and it took like ten years. And actually, the 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 uh, the, the recession of uh, two thousand and eight um, for them to actually realise that all oh, renewal was actually something they should also be chasing. And so, and that's led to the evolution of customer success. So I think we're still in early days. But to Timo's point, um, I think it's not just to, it, it is important that success is about encouraging renewals um and it goes back to my point about not selling broken processes to 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 the customer that um that okay you can sell more this year by selling them the stuff that you've got but will that make them successful if if you sell to your customer something that will make them more successful more profitable as a business in three years time then they will be buying more stuff from you in three years time than, than, uh, than if you sold them a pile of crap this year. So, so I mean, I think that kind of, and it's not just every, it, you know, it is that continuous engagement with the customer that actually I think forces a more long-term thinking from vendors um, and is an antidote to the, the kind of short-termism of Wall Street. I just want to quickly point out that that part of the issue here is that in the enterprise space, SaaS doesn't so remove the problem of vendor lock-in and, you know, renewal is not ultimately totally a choice the way it is in consumers where you're like, oh, I'm going to switch to Netflix from, you know, Disney Plus or whatever, which is like, I can do that in, in 15 minutes and I can switch my cell phone provider in a weekend, you know, you can't do that with enterprise SaaS software. And so I think renewal, while it can be a, a motivating incentive is simply not enough to overcome some of the lock-in tendencies in, in my view. Um, so Josh, I wanted to challenge you on one thing that I think is kind of interesting because in your post, you juxtaposed the more modest goals of, of pure SaaS, like Greenfield of they don't, the customers know they're not getting all the bells and whistles um, migrate to standard, have no data or migrations to manage. You can be successful relatively early, and then you contrast that with the the you know the much deeper migrations of an on-prem system, for example, like a massive overhaul, which is much more difficult to succeed in and measure. I think that's a good contrast. But the, my only thing when I read that post was I was a little bit disappointed. I think that's a very limited view, ultimately. I mean, I know you want products to be successful, but that's a pretty limited view of what SaaS can do for a customer. I mean, to me, like, if that was all SaaS software could do, I don't think I'd want to work in this industry because that's pretty boring to me. Oh, yeah, we, 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 we implemented some standard processes and did okay. You know, I, I hope we can. I hope we can be a little more ambitious about how we serve our customers. I mean, I remember... Um, uh, a few years ago being in a, a Coupa session where customers started talking about how within the context of their software, they were getting aggregated information that was showing them exactly where they stood compared to other customers. And it was a tortoise in the hair concept where you could quickly see like, yeah, you're slow, you know, like you're a tortoise on that you're behind. And, and they were talking about how valuable that was to see it at a glance. And I'm thinking like, wow, like, isn't that what 
these vendors should have always been doing if they could have done it or would have done it or had the will to do it to help us do that, like embedding that into the software to help us guide and understand what we're doing and figure out how we're screwing up in real time. And, and to me, like, like, I want to talk about a more ambitious version of SaaS than just, oh yeah, we got a vanilla project over the finish line in three months and now our, you know, we can, we can do our invoicing better. But, right. I mean, I, you know, I, I use it, I, I put that in because in all fairness, I mean, I was talking about how implementation still sucks as, you know, as I just yeah, said yeah, yeah. in reaction to Tino's comment. And yeah, of course there are, there are places where it doesn't in, in these, you know, these net new pure public cloud SaaS implementations of, of complex enterprise software generally fit that bill. And I, you know, you're absolutely, you know, <clears throat> as I said in the beginning, the implementation is just the beginning of the success journey. Right. So, so I hope that we don't stop there and say, well, it was a flaming success. Yeah, yeah. We got it over the finish line. That shouldn't be, a, that shouldn't be the end point. I, I'm Bonnie, I just want, can you back me up? Do you have data on, uh, can you talk about the, you know, the, the ER, the, the old on-premise versus cloud world a little bit in terms of success? Cause I, I don't want to be out alone on that, you know, on that rant. Josh versus Timo, uh, the grudge. No, 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 never Josh versus Timo. That wouldn't be a fair fight. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, in all of the, the implementations that we have looked at, so 2000 plus, um, you know, we see, um, you yeah, about 50% that come in on time, on budget, um, you know, plenty of those that fail to meet the, the goals intended. Um, and this is not, you know, 100% the fault of, you know, the partner or the vendor. A lot of times this is the expectations of clients that weren't realistic going into it. So I think we see similar issues that plague a cloud implementation as we we did the old on-prem stuff. Sure, probably less customizations, um, but same issues as it relates to readiness. Timo's saying, uh, might the expectations of success have evolved over time too? I think hope organizations are more demanding than they were in the past, and that might explain why the success rate hasn't gone up e even as we're quote-unquote doing better. But we're certainly selling them more complex things and saying, yeah, we're going to do more for you. So, yeah, you know, if you don't, if you don't move the needle in both, you know, on both sides of the equation, you're not going to, you're not going to fix the problem. Phil is sitting there with something to say clearly. Yeah. Phil's well, I'm not, I'm not really sitting there with something to say. I'm, I'm, I'm just, I mean, <laughs> you, what went through my mind was, oh, so the goalposts have moved. So that's why you're not succeeding. But I mean, I think, um, I mean, there is some merit in, in, in that. And perhaps the takeaway is that you, you never reach success, that it's, it, it is a destination that is constantly moving um, because customers are being demanding. And yeah, the technology industry is catching up from a long way behind where it ought to be. Um, but, uh, but, but I don't think you will ever reach a point where you can rest on your laurels and say, all our customers are successful. Um, we do not have to worry about customer success anymore because it's baked in. You know, that's One just thing. like parenting, by the way. Um, I just right. dropped my daughter yeah. off at, on the first day of college yesterday. Yeah. Okay. We got to that. Six, we got her to college. <laughs> now, we, yeah. Now let's keep, now we got to, you know, move from there. So yeah, I think, I think the concept of, Continuous success measurement is really a good one to, to add to the equation. All right. So we have some, we've achieved a little bit of a consensus on a topic there around continuing success measurements and the, the opportunity and challenges that poses for both vendors and customers. So I feel like we've accomplished something in this hour. Oh, and we also have a verb, customer successing, just for everyone who's watching that they, they can use. So uh, if for some reason you missed a meeting uh, or an important event, just say you were customer successing that day and, and Josh has you covered. I, I think Josh meant that as a, der as a, as a derogatory comment. Didn't he? It's a derogatory Never. Comment. Customer successing. <laughs> I, I'm not, I, I, I think ah, if, if it's, darn. You know, it's kind of milling about looking as though you're doing something rather than actually achieving something. Yes, uh, indeed. Yes. Josh, I want to hit on one more thing from your post because you basically, I'm not going to quote it because I won't be able to find it real quick, but you basically hammered the notion of providing vendors, providing their own numbers. You basically said, uh, and I'm paraphrasing, if your numbers aren't independently audited, then shut up. 
Uh, can you elaborate a little bit on, on on that? That's a pretty hard stance in terms of of sharing your customer success numbers. Can you elaborate on that? Well, you know, I, I, I'll start with the fact that you know every every large partner, every and pretty much every vendor has always measured how things are going. They've always said that we have survey, we do surveys. Oh yeah, we survey the customer all the time. I, there, there's a zillion data points out there, none of which have changed anything. So, you know, I start from the fact that, yeah, you all been doing this for a while and you've never gotten anywhere with your own measurements. So yeah, shut up and, you know, let someone else do it. But more importantly, you know, there's a certain vendor I'm not going to pick on in, in public because I do that all the time anyway. But, you know, if you, if you self-publish, data that's fundamentally flawed and use that in your marketing campaigns to make yourself look better than the than the competition, you're you're deceiving the market. And I think that's the other reason to shut up and get someone else. But finally, and I, you know, and I'm gonna this is why why I love what Bonnie and Bonnie and Raven Raven Intel does, because it's it's incontrovertible when it's the voice of the customer. There's just no other story to tell when you've got the customer's voice. And 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 the customer doing it freely without you know without the disincentive of having the vendor looking over the shoulder without the vendor email saying you know please fill out this anonymous survey uh, i will pick on tom siebel because he used to do that at siebel all the time and he had this completely bullshit survey that was gamed precisely thanks brent that was gamed precisely to make it impossible for the customer to say anything but yeah great job so I'm I'm I, I don't think the credibility is there. I think they gotta have the third party. We we have we have all kinds of third party services, consumer reports, you know, et cetera, that are doing this because fundamentally it shouldn't be the job of the vendor to self report. Uh, Bonnie, I just wanted to ask you in terms of your data on this. Do do vendors do vendors embrace the challenge of the kind of data you provide? Because I would think in some level, working off customer data points can also be very intimidating for a vendor. Is is there some culture change there that has to happen on the vendor side to be open to that data? Without a doubt. And um, so there are some that embrace it, run toward it, um, and are looking um, at this as a, as a way to get better. There are some that are... Um, antagonistic to it, quite frankly. Um, and this idea of, you know, keeping the customer experience closely guarded under wraps, this idea of getting reviewed mm -hmm. to some vendors um, is, is it creates a lot of trepidation. And, you know, I think that signals some, you know, perhaps some skeletons in the closet, but we have vendors who come to us all the time and ask us to delete reviews. And, you um, you know, every single review that we have is verified by multiple human hands, and we know exactly who wrote it and and that it's legitimate. And you know, you know, it's it's we don't take down reviews either. And I think it's it's pretty telling um, when we have have those uh, firms coming to us and asking to be be taken off that you know that they do not stand by customer success and um, do not embrace this idea of, um, you know, showcasing what they're doing for clients. Mm. I, I find myself torn here because I think whenever there's an accepted third party kind of um, uh, rating or something, then inevitably vendors end up gaming it. You only have to look at great places to work, for example. So, I mean, I, I um, but on the other hand, I, I think, you know, it, it, it is useful for, it is kind of um, uh, a way of judging a vendor to see whether they're open to that or not. Because as you say, Bonnie, if they're not, they probably have something to hide. Um, uh, so, so there is that. But I think the other thing that was going through my mind was that surely the best measure of customer success is you know how many of your customers are successful you know are, the, are, are all of their revenues going up all of their margins improving um are you actually helping them to be better businesses you know whatever the, me the metric is that is public and be seen can be seen in your customers performance maybe that's the way to judge this Though, though, though that's complicated because if you're in a heavily regulated industry where you get you literally get shut down if you fail some process and you just implemented software you know that allows you not to fail that process, 
that doesn't mean you've improved dramatically from the soft from the implementation of software. It really, that only means that you've 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 checked a ba very basic box. I'm not violating a regulation because the software doesn't allows me to not violate it. So, I think pure, you know again we're back to what the hell is the definition of success? I think that's that's a thing we need to build a think tank around because uh, we got a lot of different versions of that coming up. Uh, Tracy makes an interesting point about the role of the partner. Uh, she thinks 90% can be managed with clear expectations and holding the scope line. It's a delicate dance. You want to be flexible, but you have to rely on the SOW. Even if there are no cost change orders, you need a little rigor to protect both sides. I think 90% of all human conflict can be handled by meeting and setting expectations. End of story. So, yeah, I agree. So I think we got some... We, we, we made some progress in today's discussion. I wanted to see if we can build on that progress by agreeing. Uh, are there any next generation KPIs that we actually like? Uh, put, put aside all the standard SaaS metrics, which can be useful to a point. Obviously, one of the big points in this discussion was that KPIs are largely should be engagement driven. That was one of the key points in Phil's post was that the value engineering part is is doing that with the customer. So every customer is going to want to define their own. But are there any KPIs that are standing out that are closer to the mark in terms of what customers really care about? I, I, can I, well, I, I'm going to go in a slightly different direction in answer to that question because okay. one thing I that struck me about Zoho specifically is that they have this concept of um, of, of uh, trans what is it transnational localism yeah um, and uh, and and they're kind of um, they're investing in local offices and recruiting locally in areas where they do business um, and and to me that's interesting because that's like the vendor is investing not just in their customers but in the success of the communities where their customers operate um, and so that that I found kind of intriguing because in a sense that's good for business at the end of the day because you know if if you're helping that community be more prosperous the businesses that serve that uh, community will grow and uh, and and so in the end you sell more software. I would say for for me a, a huge um, indicator of success is likelihood to. Be doing business with this firm in a year from now. It's one of the questions that we ask in you know our survey is how likely are you to either purchase more software or you know rehire this partner for another uh, project. I think those are huge indicators to whether a client felt like they got the value from something. So that would be a big one for me. I need a comment on Tracy's cut. Can you put Tracy's list? Yeah, please? I like Tracy's comment. Right. Well, and honestly, Tracy, I tried to do that. <laughs> you know, and, and the problem is, is, you know, everybody thinks transparency and accountability are brilliantly great idea until you say, well, that applies to you too. And then they go, that's well, that's what me. I mean about the, that's what I mean, by the way, about the Trojan horse nature of this topic and why yeah. I like it. Cause you can it's, turn it it's back on. It's tricky. Vendors. No, but you know, I had this, you know, the vendors ran like hell. The SIs in general, you know, put up put up a fight. Um, but the customers didn't want it either. There's also, and there's legal issues as well, because if you're going to measure those things at the customer site, you you are going to have to start collecting data about employees. That becomes a complicated thing to collect because if you're eventually measuring what could be the failure of an employee to engage properly in a process, you are now, you know, you know, you got a works council if it's in Europe, uh, and maybe a newly empowered union, and if it's this country, uh, now you got them on your back. So I think I think I want the customer to be to be respond more responsible. And I think that's that's a really that because that was what shocked me. Again, I, we I could measure all day long the the net cost of failure in any for any organization and actually show them where they just poured money out the door and they still didn't want this they still were scared of having those kind of measurements in in the in process they were much happier measuring 
after the fact, like Bonnie's process or, 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 you know, or, or holding the vendor in the SI accountable, just don't hold me accountable too. Let me get a few uh, comments in the audio record. Tracy says this is controversial, it w- but it would be cool to see metrics on client engagement, following process, doing sufficient testing, and investing in change management. I think a lot of people would fall down on that last one. Also, sure. Tracy, can I pick about, up on that, John? Don't Sorry. forget about end user training. She says maybe we should encourage good behavior. Yes, Phil, go ahead. Well, I, I mean, I just want to say a customer success team that is not helping its customer. Uh, avoid mistakes is not doing its job properly um, because at the end of the day if the customer is is going to um, is, is going to uh, is going to do things which in, which mean they don't get the full benefit of the software then um, then they're ending they're going to end up not renewing or not thriving as a business so customer success has got to do that and they've got to find ways of doing that that, that obviously um, uh, you know it can be a delicate conversation. Right. A couple more audio comments for the record. Timo says it's hard to measure, but I think thriving community ecosystem is a potential useful proxy for customer success. I can certainly say this. I believe it's increasingly factoring into buying decisions in a variety of ways that are both easy and hard to document depending on the situation. But I think it's a really important point. Tracy says the truth is controversial. Maybe we just posted the gold star folks to model the way. Well, yeah, gold stars all around to the panel today. I guess we're getting into closing thoughts. Josh, you're still there, man. I was hoping we get some footage of like uh, no, no, I actually you're I getting said getting is, is escorted to the curb here. No, I set up an electric fence on the perimeter, and they're, you know they're writhing in pain right now, trying to scale it. So we're, we're safe for another another minute or two. Um, so my closing thought before I do get you know the, the hook is. You know, I think that we need to, as an industry, really continue this dialogue about what is the measurement of success. I think that that to me, the my takeaway from this is that we we've got four people here and and some brilliant commentators on the on the chat, and we're all sort of not really fixed on one core definition of success. And thank you. You're welcome, Tracy. Thank you for your comments because I think that's where we need to start. I think we need to get this. You know, we need to get this stuff um, nailed, but we got to nail nail it like everything in the world of metrics and analytics. We got to start with what do we have consensus on what we're actually measuring? Uh, Brent, Brent wants you to sing, Josh. I'm not sure where that's coming from exactly, but oh, you don't, uh, <laughs> Brent. Brent, I only do that on your show, dude. Sorry, Phil. Final words. Well, final words. I would just say this is very early in the in the majority of, of, of customer success i would say there are only a handful of companies really doing a great job uh and um and and, and most companies have, have barely started so um so watch this space i i think there's a lot of interesting stuff going to develop over the next few years and we need to carry on talking about it and writing about it oh yeah bonnie um I think customer success needs to be less squishy and more data driven. That would be my final thought. Mm-hmm. Hell yeah. yeah. And if you have it in your job title, get ready for trouble. Cause we're going to pick on you mm-hmm. I, as if I hadn't already. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Can yeah. a single person be responsible for customer success? I love that. Nope. Customer success, Titan King lead, uh, uh, a, a bit of housekeeping, uh, I don't usually do disclosures on this video show, but uh, we, we mentioned a number of Diginomica partners and non-partners on the show, but Zoho is a Diginomica partner. Judge that for what you will. Yeah. Josh is the one at fault because he wrote a blog post about Zoho and Josh isn't financially connected to Diginomica, but whatever. Zoho is a Diginomica partner. Uh, T- Tracy likes the um, the the squishy uh, metrics. Yeah, that... that <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, that's that's definitely where we should go from here, I think, is the most vague metrics possible. Um, I, I did want to say a couple things. I think um, we're measuring the wrong things for the most part. So one big thing today was better KPIs, customer driven KPIs defined by the customer. Um, and then um, that notion of independent auditing and supervision, adult supervision and independent supervision, I think is so vitally important. Uh, through all phases in in a project and beyond, right? Like, 
you really, I think, need a voice in the mix that is not driven by the primary financial relationships if you're going to get anything done. And then we have this unresolved question of how publicly traded companies can handle the tension between these long-term goals and short-term investor pressures. And I think that would take us another hour to get through that one. So, but wow, what a, what a good one. That was fun. Did we miss anything? Just the fact, I think, I I think Bonnie's glasses are matching her blouse, which is, is that possible? I just Uh, noticed that. I found that. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I'm sorry. I, that is a completely non sequitur, but um, <laughs> the fact, uh, I, I, I think Bonnie's background is great as well. I think the whole composition is uh, we, deserves compliments. I, I get a good customer success rating for this. All right. Yeah, right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. And Phil, thanks for making it through, man. I'm, I'm sure. Yeah. yeah. Really Impressive. Getting there after your jet lag of a week, there you probably crash hard after this. Yeah, yeah, definitely going to crash now. More digital should mean more measurement and less squishiness. Uh, Brent, I think that's a good good note to end on. Let's be less squishy and more yeah. more precise in, in how we do things. Thanks all. This was a blast. And thanks, yeah. uh, Brent, also for welcoming me back. Uh, it has been a while. Had to overcome some things, but hopefully the show will be a little more regular this fall. It's amazing how much effort it takes to create a totally unscripted show. Uh, but that's a whole other story. Thanks, everyone. Thank Thank you. you. It's been a great one. Good to see you all. Bye. Have a great weekend. Bye-bye.